In this short video, I'd like to go over some of the typical research approaches and experimental designs you might encounter in quantitative research. In particular, I'd like to discuss when to actually use which approach, what are the pros and cons of the different ones, and why you might use which approach when. So one thing you could do is actually create your own cheat sheet. So cheat sheets are super useful. You might know several ones have used them before. You can find them for all kinds of different topics, statistics, research methods, probability, and so on. But somehow we couldn't find cheat sheet that really worked well for the context we had. So what I'd like to do now, go over a couple of different cheat sheets we developed ourselves for a research methods course that I taught over a few years already and discuss them. And in this first part, I'd like to talk specifically about research approaches. In a second video, I'll talk also more about experimental designs. So mainly I'd like to discuss which to use when, give some guidelines, and maybe some examples. Before going in there, I owe a lot of thanks to all the wonderful students who helped with that and actually created these cheat sheets with lots of iterations and feedback from everybody else. So I'd like to start with an overview of how to actually decide what research approach to use or what research approach an existing study actually uses and go through a decision table, basically. So the first question you can ask is, okay, is there an actual control over the variables? So was there anything manipulated? If not, then you're in the range of non-experimental research. So this could be descriptive research. So basically, if you did not have a clear hypothesis before the experiment, so it could be more ex explanatory research, comparative design, and so on, then you're in the range of more descriptive, observational research. This could be quali uh, qualitative, could be quantitative mixed method. But the idea is if you don't have manipulation and no pre-designed hypothesis, then it, it's more in the range of descriptive research. Now, if you have a hypothesis before but did not control for anything, then you're in the range of correlational research. So there you can explore potential relationships between different variables, but because it did not explicitly control anything, you cannot really infer causality because you don't know which variable might have influenced what, or if there is actually a correlation, uh, more than just a correlation, if there's actual a causation. To do this, you basically need to control some variables. So control some independent variables. Now, if you cannot really assign the groups randomly, then you're in the range of quasi-experimental research. So this, again, tests more for the correlation between variables. So it does test for causality. But if you cannot assign the different groups, then there might be some confounds there. So on the positive side, this is a lot more time and cost efficient sometimes, but you have little control over the variables and you don't explicitly manipulate the variables. So this is quasi-experimental research. So you cannot really infer causality here. To do that, you really need to assign the groups randomly and manipulate the independent or control variables. So then you're in the range of experimental research. So there you basically have a great control over the different variables. You can establish cause and effects. The main idea is you manipulate one or more things and try to leave everything else the same and then if you do find a difference between the different conditions, then you can more or less safely assume, okay, there is an actual effect. So this can lead to more replicable results. And often this can be randomized controlled studies, kind of the gold standard off enough where you have a proper one or more different control groups, control conditions, you randomize variables, you can do interventions. So I'd like to start with discussing experimental approaches. So what are they good for? Basically, if you want to establish a causal relationship, you basically have to use experimental methods. And that's feasible, especially if you have a large enough number of participants or whatever you're investigating. So you have control over the independent variable, you can do randomized controlled 
assignments of the different participants to the different conditions, that's when you're in the range of experimental methods. What could go wrong is, well, it's really hard to do this when you don't have enough participants, you don't have enough power to run this kind of study, especially if you want to do a between subjects design, or something went wrong with the kind of randomization. So you forgot to randomize, there's some confounds, or these kind of things. So for example, if you want to investigate if a, a MacBook helps undergrads get higher GPA, then those who use a PC, the problem is unless you actually would give people a MacBook and a PC randomly, then there are always some confounds, basically, because you cannot randomize. You can't just uh, compare the Mac versus PC users because there might be other reasons why some have a Mac versus a PC. So how could you avoid things going sideways? Well. It's really important to randomize and control for just about anything that you can. So you randomize the participants, you can randomize or counterbalance the different conditions. So if you do randomization, use a random number generator. If you do counterbalancing, make sure you do it properly. If there's too many conditions, you can do use Latin square uh, designs. Now, if you cannot randomly assign your participants to the different groups and conditions, then you're in the range of quasi-experimental methods. So for example, this could be because you simply cannot change the group categories, like they might be pre-existing groups. So for example, if you want to compare males and females, this is nothing you can assign. These are pre-existing groups, or sometimes it can be simply unethical. For example, if you want to investigate the effect of uh, smoking, then it would be unethical to ask people to smoke to, uh, a pack of cigarettes a day for uh, several months or years. Now, what could go wrong there is basically if you try to claim causality in a quasi-experimental method, that's just not feasible. You don't know this because you couldn't randomize the different study group assignments. So, for example, if you, let's say, wanted to investigate the effect of having or getting a bachelor, master's or PhD on the future salary, then yes, you can see whether there's a correlation, but because you cannot assign people to getting a bachelor, a master's or a PhD, you don't know whether there's a causal relationship. There might be something else that gets people to do a PhD and it's not the PhD itself that might get them a higher salary in the end. So what are things to avoid? Well, first of all, just don't claim things you cannot claim. If you use a quasi-experimental or non -ex any other non-experimental approach, just don't claim a causal relationship. So one thing could be to just phrase it a lot more carefully so you don't overstate your case. And you could try and make the different groups more comparable or test how comparable they are. Like you could do other tests. You could do a pre-post-test. You could do an interrupted time series, for example. Or, for example, in a longitudinal study, you can measure something before and a couple of time after the treatment to see this. And finally, I'd like to talk about observational methods. So if you cannot manipulate anything, if if you cannot run an experimental or quasi-experimental approach, then you're in the range of observational methods. And these can be really great if you want to have a naturalistic setting, if you want to observe how people respond, behave in a natural setting without much interference or asking people to go in the lab. This is a really good method to use. It's not easy to use. There's a whole range of things to consider there, but there's some simplicity in the sense that you only record data based on what you can observe. But of course, what can go wrong is uh, you can basically bias people or somehow affect them if they know they're being observed, if they might figure out what you want to do. Observer effect is possible in all kinds of uh, circumstances, but especially in a naturalistic setting, if you suddenly add an observer, this can have a strong effect. And of course, there's always confound. So if you observe something, you don't have control over all the other variables like you do in a more experimental setting. So you tend to have more confound. So it's much harder to draw strong conclusions on that. And definitely don't try to infer any causality. Just because you observe a correlation doesn't mean that is a causal correlation. So what can you do to improve these methods? 
Well, one of it is, of course, take lots of notes, good observation, record it, use proper procedures. There's a lot you can look into in terms of qualitative research methods, having multiple coders, member checking, all these kind of things, having a clear coding system, way to analyze it. And then it can be a super useful method. Just be aware that this is more descriptive. So you cannot infer causality, but you can learn a lot in terms of how things work, what people do, why they do this, these kind of things. Now, these are just one type of cheat sheets. Our lovely student they actually created lots of different ones. Here's another one if you want to have a look at a different type of cheat sheet. Here's another one that is structured a bit differently. I guess the core aspect is here really make sure to get familiar with whatever summary or cheat sheet you use. Use them, create your own, update them as needed, and let me know if you created any cool ones. I'm happy to share them. Thanks for listening.